So today, as we continue our series on love, sex, and marriage, we are going to look at communication and conflict. And we're going to look at these subjects because every true relationship has conflict. Now, maybe not initially, but conflict will happen. Amen? Yes? Yes? Sometimes, you know, when we least expect it. I remember when Cindy and I got engaged, and you know, when you're engaged, that's just that lovey-dovey time. You know, I was Timmy, she was Cindy. You know, lovey-dovey. And then we went to register for our wedding. And we registered at Macy's and Crate and Barrel. And I mean, that should be fun, right? You're picking out stuff and saying, if you bought this for me, that'd be great. If you bought this for me, we got into a huge fight when we were registering for our wedding. And I just remember thinking, that was a miserable day. And I remember thinking, what have we gotten ourselves into? So Church of the Resurrection, which is a large United Methodist Church in Kansas City, they did a, a big survey on dating and relationships and marriage. 5,000 people took this survey. 1,500 single folks, 3,500 married folks. So throughout today's message, I've got a, some uh, results from this survey. And one of the things I appreciate about it is that it is a survey of United Methodists. So these are folks in a United Methodist Church. And one of the questions they asked in this survey, they, specifically for married couples, they asked, how often do you have conflict? And, and I want to show you uh, the results of this survey. And specifically, how, often, how many couples fight at least once a week? Okay. And this is broken down by age group. So couples in their 20s, 51% said, we fight at least once a week. Jumps, right? It jumps in the 30s. It's the one group that jumps up. 58% said, we fight at least once a week. In the 40s, 54%. In the 50s, 43%. In the 60s, 41%. In the 70s, 38%, and in the 80s, 24%. So if you are in your 30s and you're fighting a lot, it gets better. Wait till your 80s. <laughs> That's the takeaway that I see from this survey. Actually, one of the things I really find helpful about this survey is that if you are having conflict, you're normal, right? Sometimes it's just helpful because sometimes in marriage or in relationships, we think, is this just us? Is this just me? And you realize, no, actually, this is something we all experience. We all experience conflict. And I, I must say, Cindy and I, we've been married for 17 years, and we do have less conflict now than we used to, but we still have it. And as I was uh, preparing for the sermon, I sat down and I thought, when's the last time we had a good conflict? You know, not just like, not just your, some common in passing, oh, that was weird, you know, but like a good conflict. And actually, I had to think about it for a while, and I thought, oh, yes, I remember. And I told Cindy, she knew, I, you know, I said, oh, yes, I remember. It was two or three months ago, and the backstory, uh, the church I served in San Diego, uh, they're celebrating their 100th anniversary, actually, in a couple weeks. And so, like a year ago, they said, for our 100th anniversary, we want all former pastors to come. So we really want you to come and be a part of the 100th anniversary. And in fact, we'll pay your way to come and be a part of this weekend. Great. You know, I said, I want to honor the church in that way. So Cindy knew about this. I knew about this months ago. But, you know, a few months ago, I started to look at tickets. And so I went, to, uh, you know, went online and I said, these are the dates that I think make sense. And in my mind, if you're going to fly to San Diego, you don't want to just be there on Saturday and Sunday. You know, give it a couple days beforehand. Like I lived there for over 25 years. I've got family. I've got friends there. So one night, Cindy's in her office. I come in. I say, just want to let you know, I, I got tickets for San Diego and I'm planning to be from here to here. And she said, oh, you're taking a little vacation. I got defensive by that. And, and then uh, she said, well, who are you planning to see? And I said, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't booked. I haven't done any of that yet, but I'm planning to go for these days. And we kind of started going back and forth. And, and she kept asking me questions, and I kept saying, I don't know. And at one point she said, well, because when you're gone for these days, that means I've got to rearrange work and I've got the kids. And so if I knew what you were doing and why you were doing it, I could really like, kind of be with you in this. And in my mind, I'm like, why do I need to explain? <laughs> I'm going to San Diego. So it seems self-evident to me. Okay, maybe that's a typical guy thing. I don't know. <laughs> so... Like, why do I need to explain why I'm wanting to spend a few extra days in San Diego? So we kind of, it starts to build, right? You know, the tension starts to build. And I just remember at one point, Cindy basically says to me, now if I was, if it was me doing this, right? You got to love that. 
I did the same thing. I did the same thing. But if it was me doing this, I would have checked with you in advance and I would have specifically asked, is this okay with you? Yes, others? Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, in my mind, it's like when I'm telling you these are what I'm planning to do, I am communicating with you, right? I mean, we, so, but I said, well, if this was me and you were wanting to go to California for a few days, I would say go. <laughs> if that's something you want, I would say do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Preach, oh wow, the guys are with me. Wow, okay, this is interesting dynamic. So, <laughs> so it's one of those arguments that started in the, in the guest room and the office and then I remember just being in bed at night still like going back and forth. You know, the lights are out, you're still in bed, on the head's on the pillow, but, and then I just remember saying, okay, let's just agree to disagree on this, we are getting nowhere, this conversation's done, right? And then I just kind of went into pout mode, you know, I went and changed my ticket right away and, and changed the dates just to kind of be spiteful. Very immature, but that's what I did. <laughs> so that's the last really kind of good conflict we had, and it was conflict about a trip to San Diego. Well, in this survey, they asked couples, what do you fight about? And I wanna show you. So first, men and then women. So this is the men's list. This is according to the men. These are 3,500 men, married men in this church said, here's the five things we fight about. So number five, fifth most common thing we fight about is household responsibilities. Inattentive to my spouse's needs. All right, that, that causes conflict. Fifth or fourth, sex. Third, feeling unappreciated. Second, money and finances. And then the first, according to men, communication. Failure to listen. So that's what the men said. This is what we fight about. Now if we look at the women's list, we're going to see a, it's really similar actually. But for women, the fifth common, so the fifth common thing, they said, you know, this is what we fight about is children. Fourth common, household responsibilities. Third, feeling unappreciated. Second, money, finances, and then the number one source of conflict, according to the women, was communication, failure to listen. Now, I think it's interesting how similar these, these lists are, right? Women have children in there, men have sex in there, <laughs> go figure. Um, but what I find very interesting is that for both men and women, the number one cause of conflict is communication, is a failure to listen to each other. So both men and women identified that as the number one cause of conflict. Now, in this survey, they also asked these couples, what frustrates you about your partner? If you could change something about your partner, what would it be? What would you change about him or her? I want to show you the results. So first, the men. Okay, this is what the men said. Fifth most common thing. She criticizes me. Fourth, she is negative. Third, she overreacts. Second, she nags me. And the number one answer, she's disinterested in sexual intimacy. Okay, so that is, this is the men speaking. All right, now, how do you think this is going to compare with the women? So here's what the women said. Uh, fifth most common, what would I change if I could change something about my husband? He's negative. Number four, he fails to help me around the house. Now, take notes, guys, all right? These are, we can take notes on these. Third, he's short-tempered. Second, he doesn't share his feelings with me. And number one, he doesn't listen to me. Does that resonate? Some on that list, some on that list, yes. Some are scared to shake their head. It's okay. <laughs> so, now, what's interesting is that these lists are, they're different in some ways, right? I mean, it's interesting that for, the, for men, the, the, the issue of sexual intimacy comes up. For women, it's the sharing of feelings and listening that come up as, as really the needs that they have, the felt need that, that they have. But there are similarities in this list as well. And what I think is interesting is that for both the men and the women, um, it's, it's the negativity and the criticism that they have a hard time with. 
And, and we know that, we all know that we don't thrive in a negative environment, right? No one thrives in a negative environment at work. And that's true at home, right? We don't thrive in the midst of negativity. And so it's a challenge for both men and women to be with someone who is harsh. So the question is, how do we do conflict? How do we resolve conflict without being harsh or, or critical of each other? And I think Paul's teaching in Ephesians 4, which we just heard, gives us some helpful tools for navigating that. And as we study Paul's words, one of the things we discover is that there's a difference between disciplined anger and undisciplined anger. In verse 26, Paul writes, In your anger, do not sin. Or be angry, but do not sin. Notice Paul doesn't write, don't be angry. He writes, in your anger, do not sin. That means that being angry, in and of itself, is not a sin. We are made in the image of God with a God-given sense of right and wrong, with a, an internal justice barometer. And when someone does something that is wrong to us, anger is a healthy response. Emotions are a good thing. And the fact that we are made in the image of God means that God has emotions. God gets angry. So the problem isn't anger. The problem is what we do with our anger. And according to Paul, when it comes to resolving conflict well, we need to practice disciplined anger. Here are three qualities of what that looks like. First, disciplined anger rises slowly, while undisciplined anger is easily provoked. Psalm 103 tells us that God is slow to anger. Slow to anger. And James, in the books of, book of James, encourages us to be like God in this way. James 1.19 says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Those are good, good guidelines in any relationship, right? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Are you slow to become angry? Is that how your coworkers, your friends, your children, your girlfriend, your husband would describe you? You know, for a long time, I saw myself as someone who was slow to become angry, but then two things happened. Marriage and parenting. <laughs> Marriage and parenting have shown me sides of my anger that I never knew were there before. Uh, when I worked at IndyMac Bank, this mortgage bank, every now and then a coworker would come up to me and say, Tim, you are so nice. I can't imagine you ever being angry. And I would say, really, you should talk to my wife about that. As a husband and as a father, I have to work at harnessing my emotions. Disciplined anger rises slowly while undisciplined anger explodes quickly. Second, Disciplined anger never spends the night while undisciplined anger moves in to stay. Paul writes, in your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. For couples wanting to resolve conflict well, Paul's advice is very practical. Don't go to bed angry. Don't go to bed refusing to talk to your spouse. Don't go to bed saying, I'll sleep on the couch. Don't go to bed rehearsing the lines of what you're going to say in the morning. Rather than holding on to it and curling up with anger, kiss it goodnight as your head hits the pillow. Is that easy to do? No! If it was easy to do, Paul wouldn't have to write, do this. It's a discipline and disciplines are by nature costly. It costs us something to let go of anger. So why do it? Because the alternative is far worse. The alternative is to become an angry person. The alternative is to become someone who holds grudges. In verse 31, Paul lays out the progression of undisciplined anger. He writes, get rid of all anger, rage and bitterness, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. If we hold on to anger, 
it turns into bitterness. And bitterness turns into brawling, which means shouting and violence. Which then turns into malice, the determination to harm another. Undisciplined anger is a very ugly thing. In its most extreme form, it's what we saw in the, in the Ray Rice video that I know many of you are familiar with that made headlines last year. Ray Rice, star running back, right, for the Baltimore Ravens, was seen in a video punching his fiancée, knocking her out in the, in the elevator of a hotel. Every 15 seconds in our country, a woman is hit by her boyfriend or husband. This is an issue inside the church and outside the church. Undisciplined anger can lead to abuse, physical abuse or verbal abuse, which in and of itself can be very damaging. When we let anger move in and stay, when we allow it to build up in our hearts, it can be very destructive. Disciplined anger never spends the night, while undisciplined anger moves in to stay. Third, disciplined anger chooses words that build up, while undisciplined anger chooses words that tear down. In verse 29, Paul writes, Do not let any evil or unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now, the Greek word that is translated as evil or unwholesome means putrid. Picture leftovers that have been in the fridge for six months. You pull out the Tupperware dish, you take off the lid, and the smell knocks you out. That's the Greek word that Paul uses to describe the kind of words that people can spew. Words that tear each other down verbally. Cindy and I once lived next to a couple that had just gotten married. Um, but our, our homes were close enough that we could hear them fight their arguments. Anyone ever heard that Yeah. Anyone scared of that? I know my best friend moved in next to his pastor and he's like, Oh my gosh, the pastor's going to hear us fighting. But we, this couple, I would try not to hear them. I would like close the windows. I'm like, I'm not, but I could hear them. And I was just blown away at the, how mean the things they said to each other. They, I just thought they would not speak to a friend this way. Just the, the disrespectful things that they would say to each other. Just cutting things. And I would find myself praying for them. Because I just thought, if they speak to each other this way, their relationship is not going to last. In our key relationships, we can use our words to build others up, or we can use our words to tear them down. And for me, this is a great litmus test as a husband and as a parent. You know, when I'm, when I'm angry, are, are, are my words that I that I say towards my two sons. Do they, do they build them up or do I just want to let them have it? Or, or when I'm speaking to, to Cindy and, and I'm upset, am I, am I thinking, am I conscious, aware of her needs or I just have a need to vent? One pastor writes, I say the most hurtful things to the people I love the most. Isn't that true a lot of the times? We say the most hurtful things to the people we love the most. Words said in anger can leave a permanent scar. Getting it off your chest, letting it rip, holding nothing back can destroy a relationship. Words have the power to do that. Why? Why are words so powerful? Why are they so important? Because what we say expresses who we are. Jesus put it this way, out of the abundance of of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our words reveal what's in our heart, what's really going on in here. Now, I think that in this way, conflict can be a gift 
Because conflict reveals our character. As I said at the beginning of this series, the goal of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is to become like him. To be shaped by his values and his character. To be a Christian is to invite Jesus to come and live in us and change us from the inside out. And conflict helps us see where we need to change. I know that's been so true for me when I think about marriage and, and conflict in our marriage. It has been a, a tool. It has been a way in which I have seen the ways that I need to change. The ways that I need to grow. The ways that I need Jesus and his grace in my life. Notice how Paul concludes this teaching. He writes, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. Ultimately, no marriage can survive without forgiveness. And that's true because we hurt each other, especially those we are closest to. At times, we say and do the wrong thing. Which is why grace is key in every relationship. Forgiveness is key in every relationship. I remember our former pastor saying to me, here are the seven essential words of marriage. You're right. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. No marriage can survive without forgiveness. Without learning to say, I'm sorry, or please forgive me, and, and learning to say, I forgive you, or, or you're forgiven. You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of qualities that I really value uh, about Cindy, but I think one in particular is her ability to forgive. I have these clear memories. I can even remember locations, San Diego, L.A., Paris. I can remember these places where I just did something that was wrong, that was hurtful. And, you know, my initial thought is to kind of be excuse, make excuses, get defensive. But then you just reach that point where you go, wow, I was just wrong. I'm sorry. And Cindy has forgiven me in those times. And, and I feel like that dynamic, her forgiveness has taught me a lot about God's forgiveness. It's made it real. It's made it tangible. I have a, me a much deeper understanding at this point in my life of what it means that God forgives me because Cindy has forgiven me. And she has moved on from that. You know, hasn't held on to it. Hasn't brought it back. Hasn't used it as kind of a weapon in later arguments. I feel like when she has forgiven me, it's been a full forgiveness. And it has been an expression, an experience of God's forgiveness. Forgive one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's the key. In Christ, God forgave you. We choose kindness over rage because that is what God has done. We choose compassion over payback because that is what God has done. We choose to forgive rather than holding on to a grudge because God has forgiven us us. In order to forgive others, the first thing we need to do is receive God's forgiveness. We are loved and accepted and forgiven in spite of all that we've done. Amen? You are loved, accepted, and forgiven in spite of all that you've done. I am loved, accepted, and forgiven in spite of all that I've done because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. That's the reality God invites us to live in this week. And that's the reality we celebrate at the communion table. 